all of you to the University of Tulsa College of Law. For those I've not met this year, I'm Lynn Enseroth. I'm the Dean of the College of Law. And it is a privilege to welcome you tonight and introduce Professor and Vice Chancellor Jerry Kong, who is our lecturer this evening for the 16th annual Buck Colbert Franklin Memorial Civil Rights Lecture. <laughs> the Buck Colbert Franklin Lecture honors Buck Franklin, one of Oklahoma's first African-American attorneys and the father of the eminent historian, Professor John Hope Franklin. Mr. Franklin moved to Tulsa in 1921 and was in the process of relocating his family when the tragic Tulsa race riot it just, the race riot destroyed his office and the home where he was going to live with his family. <coughs> in the immediate aftermath of the riot, working in a tent on a burned out grounds of the riot, Mr. Franklin brought numerous suits on behalf of African American victims and won a court decision striking down a city ordinance designed to prevent African Americans from rebuilding their homes in Tulsa. He remained active as an attorney in Tulsa until 1980. <coughs> it is Mr. Franklin's commitment to civil rights, to dignity, to giving voice to the dispossessed and injured that we recognize in this lecture series. And it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce this year's featured lecturer for this distinguished lecture series. Jerry Kahn is the Professor of Law and Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the University of California at Los Angeles. He is a gifted teacher and distinguished scholar. And Professor Kahn's scholarly interests include civil procedure, race, and communication. He is an expert in the Asian American community <coughs> and has written about hate crimes, affirmative action, the Japanese American internment as well as the lessons this experience provides to the 21st century war on terror. With respect to race, Professor Kong focuses on the nexus between implicit bias and the law. He regularly collaborates with experimental social psychologists on a wide range of scholarly education and advocacy issues including implicit bias, attitudes, or stereotypes that we may not be aware of or endure. In this evening's lecture entitled The Force of Implicit Bias, Science and Rhetoric, Professor Kong will address the, implicit, the implications of such implicit bias for law, legal, and social institutions. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kong. It's my first time in Tulsa, and I'm very excited. I'm very excited. It's obviously an honor to give this lecture, and in a weird way, to think about think about uh, the most explicit form of violence and hatred that the race riots reminds us of. It makes it seem odd that we be talking about implicit biases, but every generation has a different set of problems, and every challenge looks a little bit different. And I'm going to talk a little bit about implicit bias and the work that it does in actually potentially altering our institutions. I'm going to start with this idea of a tournament of merit. It's a term that I like. You know, what does it mean? I, I think a tournament of merit is something that we as Americans see. You, you're in the law. You know that law is a competitive uh, game, right? We're living in an increasingly global, hyper-competitive environment where you have to hustle, you have to win. So it is a tournament. If you work in a firm, you know that it is meant to be a pyramid. There is meant to be leverage. It is meant to be a hard game. No one guarantees you success, but what we seek ultimately is a tournament of merit, where you are judged on the basis of your merits, right? Whether you succeed, whether you survive this game, ought to be a function of your hustle and your ability. So that is what we seek. But when we look at the world around us, whether they be law partnerships, whether they be faculties, whether they be CEO boardrooms, what we find is that the tournament results don't seem to be evenly distributed. When we look at the winners of the tournaments, right? <coughs> You have the same class of winners. You have more men than women. You have more white folks than non-white folks. All the categories that divide us, you see a predictable set of winners and losers. The disparities themselves 
are not contested. We see them plainly. What's contested instead is why. Why are there such disparities? Is it just the product of a meritocratic sort? Uh, hey, look, we designed a game. It's supposed to be a turn of merit. It's a fair game. Some people win, some people lose. I don't know why these people always win. I don't know why these people always lose. It is what it is, maybe mildly regrettable, but it is what it is. Is it just the product of a meritocratic sort, or is it possibly, just possibly, also a product of discrimination? Is the game rigged? Now, I think the answer, of course, matters. If the game has been fair, and it turns out some people win and some people lose, it is what it is. We can try to make something fair on the back end. But if the game is rigged, even the winners don't want to be winners of that game. I get it, people like their boats, people like their yachts. But the point is, we all seek a tournament of merit. And whether we have it, whether we're fighting it, is an incredibly important question. I think in order to test whether or not we live in a world of merit, I want to share with you some really interesting science that comes from the experimental, you know, sort of mind sciences, principally social psychology. And I want to start with implicit bias. When I talk about implicit bias, I almost always start with that black thing up there. It's a chair. If it were a white thing like that, you also recognize it's a chair. If it's a wooden thing like that, you also <laughs> recognize it's a chair. These, like, I don't know, mauve, I, I, I can't tell what these colors are. <laughs> not especially attractive, I'm sorry. These chairs, whatever they are, look. It's a chair. They all look different. They might use fabrics, but you knew that it was a chair. Anything with a bottom and a back, you recognize immediately as a chair. It doesn't even have to be movable. Like these are fixed to the actual tables. We know it's a chair. How? Because we're really good at object recognition. We have a schema or a template of knowledge to recognize chairs, right? And so we know what a chair is. And immediately you respond to a chair by pulling it out and putting your butt down. Unless you're going mm -hmm. antiquing, unless you're anxious after a vacation, you've gained a little weight and can actually go through the chair. <laughs> <laughs> you don't spend that much time processing bit by bit information regarding a chair. How, how could it be otherwise, right? Think about it. I speak fairly quickly. You're digesting some cheese as well as some wine. Hopefully, it's going to loosen up a little bit, laugh more at my jokes. Your things are beeping in your breast pockets that you're being polite and not checking. Everything's happening in real time. There's way too much information that, that's happening in real time for you not to chunk the world through schemas. How could it be otherwise, right? How would you learn how to drive if you actually had to pay attention to every signal without seeing things in larger categories. What's interesting is that we don't only do this with chairs, we do this also with human beings, right? So think about it. When you see me up here on screen, what are you doing? You're engaged in a lot of auto processing. It's like you're like, you know, Samsung S6 or your iPhone 6S Plus. You're doing a lot of auto focusing. You're coming to my face and you're actually categorizing me by multiple schemas. There are lots of them. The younger people would put me into social categories that I might call hashtagging, right? So <laughs> look, what I, I'm a professional. I dress in a suit. I present as male, I'm like almost 48, I definitely am middle aged, and I present as Asian. Race is a chronically accessible social category. I know some of you say you don't see race, but it turns out you do. And it turns out <laughs> hashtag me as Asian. You might have done Asian American. If you're going to ethnicity, you might think like, I don't know, this dude might be like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, wait, that's not a Japanese last name, definitely not Filipino, definitely not Asian Indian, never understood why they all belong to the same category, were afraid to ask, lest some vice chancellor like train you on the <laughs> for another two hours. But you immediately do visual inspection, we're walking past each other at the mall, immediately, hashtag Asian. But a hashtag Asian means that you've created a memory, and that means potentially everything you've ever hashtag Asian in your entire life could be activated. <laughs> I don't know what you've got. I don't know what you've got. But a social psychologist would describe this kind of cloud of information uh, in terms of attitudes and stereotypes, because I want to get the definitions out and be very clear. Um, let me uh, spend some time uh, unpacking those things. An attitude is an overall analogy of valence. It's just like or dislike, approach or avoid. You know, smile versus frown, thumbs up versus thumbs down. That's all uh, that it is. And so it's just a gross overall reaction uh, toward the category. So you have to figure out what is your attitude toward Asian people, right? Is it friendly? Is it like if you pass me in the middle of the night on some hidden hallway or something like that, you get anxious, you smile? A stereotype is actually something a little bit more narrow. It is a trait associated with a category. So if I ask you to think about the category fish, you probably think of the trait swim. If I think about the category bird, you probably think about the trait fly. Now, not all birds fly. Like the chickens you eat regularly couldn't possibly fly. I think ostriches run. Penguins are birds, right? They swim. But generally speaking, not stereotyping, birds fly. 
NSA surveil. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have a category, you have a trait associated with it. It's probabilistic in some sense. That's what we mean by stereotypes. But once your category is Asian, what traits do you associate with this body type? Do you think it more likely <laughs> that if I told you that, you know, you think it's a little bit more likely on some base rate as compared to whatever you think to be the baseline that I got a perfect score on my math SAT? That's amazing. I didn't say verbal. Do you think if we do the cross or something else, I actually have a second degree black belt in exotic East Asian martial arts? A little bit more likely on whatever, you know, compared to whatever you think of the baseline that. I was raised by a tiger mother, according to Fred. I live six hours a day since I I performed at Carnegie Hall at the age of 16. <laughs> Two out of these three are true, discuss. But the point is, um, uh, even with a busy signal going in the background, it, it seems entirely reasonable for you to recognize that attitudes and stereotypes matter, at least on the margins, right? So you never have perfect information about the people you interact with. Uh, and you're picking up individuating information about me in real time, right? And don't, don't get me wrong, you want to make good decisions, but when you have imperfect information, you're going to break in terms of attitudes and stereotypes. And there's decades of research that demonstrates that on the margins, your attitudes and stereotypes actually matter uh, in subtle ways. So look, if I want to know whether you're fair and square, if I want to know whether you are participating with me in the Tournament of Merit, I actually want to peek in your heads and try to figure out what your attitudes and stereotypes actually are. But when I do that, I run into some difficulty. I run into at least a willing and a able problem. So number one, you might not be willing. Suppose you have explicit bias. Explicit bias, by definition, is just an explicit attitude or an explicit stereotype. It means it's directly, introspectively accessible. That means if I ask you, like, what do you think about Asian women? You can close your eyes and say, Asian women, got it, got it, got it. I got my views. Please don't share them out loud. But the point <laughs> is, you got views, you can ask yourself, ping yourself, and get an answer. For all kinds of reasons, these explicit biases you might be aware of that you might think are entirely appropriate to have, you might not want to share them in public, right? I don't know how many glasses of wine you've already had, but really, <laughs> unless you're with a tipsy, the last thing you want to say, even though you think it's ultimately justified, the last thing you want to say is something that might actually be recorded and get flack, and you might get fired, you might have to do some penance. Look, you think people can't handle the truth, so you keep it to yourself. This is why lawyers cross-examine under oath. We get it, right? You might not be willing to tell people what you actually think. But here's something that's far more spooky. What if you're not able? So what if, by definition, there are implicit biases, which is attitudes and stereotypes that you have no direct introspective access to? That means you could be honest as hell, right, and say, look, this is what I really want to figure out. What are my attitudes towards X, towards black men? What if you actually can't? Self-report. So Edward Cooperate is a psychologist who in 1911 published this really interesting paper. He was working with a woman who was suffering from coarse cough syndrome, which meant that she could not form new short-term memories. She was like the character uh, Leonard in the movie Memento. So like he had been treating her for months, but she couldn't recognize him. So one morning, he uh, sees a patient, and he decides quite deviously to hide something very sharp, a pin in his hand. He reaches out to shake hers. She says, hello, nice to meet you for the first time, because she doesn't remember, and she jerks back in pain. She just got stabbed. The next morning he arrives, she doesn't recognize him because she can't form new short-term memories. He extends his hand out to shake hers. This time, she politely declines. Mm -hmm. When asked, she says, well, I, you know, doesn't the lady have a right not to shake someone's hand? Maybe something is hidden there. So even though she could not consciously or explicitly recall the prior day's events, the pain, that shock, that trauma the prior day left an imprint on her mind which altered her behavior going forward. So that's an implicit memory and implicit attitudes and stereotypes have to be stored in our memory system. So that raises this really interesting question. Is it possible you got junk in your head about all kinds of people, whether it be black men or Asian men, that you don't even have direct and perspective access to? So if that's possible, it's just a scientific hypothesis, how would you find out? Well, then what would you do? As a scientist, you have to m measure, not ask, right? If you want to figure out how much someone weighs, you ask them. You just put them on a scale sometimes, because maybe people don't remember correctly. So how would you measure stuff? You think, well, 
what, fMRIs, uh, that's kind of expensive. You think I come up really close to you into your face and look for micro twitch movements on your face and say lie to me. You can take galvanic skin response and see whether you're sweating when I ask you, do I look good? Like what, yeah, how do you do that? It turns out the easiest way to do it, the most cost effective way, and it sounds entirely preposterous, is to have you play a sort of video game. And the only way you'll accept that that's even possible is to do this one little exercise with me. Now even in this low contrast uh, visibility room, I think you can pull this off. Ignore the letters, focus only on the colors. This is a standard screw cap. When I say go, I want you to go down columns one, two, and three and just scream out the colors. So uh, just so that we can get uniform, I see green, red, purple, green. Yeah, I, I've trained you for mm -hmm. column number one. Mm -hmm. Ready, set, go. Green, red, purple, green, blue, yellow, blue, red, green, yellow, red, purple. Pretty good. With low visibility, I'm, I'm impressed. Again, uh, imagine that the people of Oklahoma have passed a constitutional amendment that requires you to be semantically blind. It's your legal, ethical obligation to ignore the letters focused only on the colors. Ready, set, go. Green, green, red, purple, purple, green, blue, yellow, blue, red, green, yellow, red, purple. So fast, tight formation, oddly tight formation. <laughs> <laughs> teamwork, teamwork, I love team spirit. Uh, so go, go golden hurricane. Uh, so uh, the third time should be a charm, practice effect now is standing, ready, set, go. Green, red, red purple, purple, green. green. Green, yellow, red, purple. Totally. Totally threw me off. Yeah, like what? Look, it's a it's a cheap parlor trick. It works every time. So here's the thing: our brains are really good at sorting um, uh, items that are associated very quickly together. So when you see the word red and the color red, because you are very good readers and you can see the color, we can sort them very quickly together. But when you see the word red and the color green, it's like, yeah, he says be semantically blonde. That sounds professorial. That means ignore the letters. Green. It takes just a little bit longer. It's not that you can't do it. Of course you can do it, but you feel a little drag as if your brain is caught in molasses or you know, <laughs> atrophy, something that slows you down. It's that cheesy little insight that the speed of reaction could measure the strength of mental associations that drive a whole bunch of reaction time measures, including the really well-known IAT. So if I want to know what your attitude, the implicit attitude that you might have towards, say, black men are, here's what I would do. I'd say, hey, just sit down in front of the computer. Sometimes you'll see white guys, like this guy, hit a key with your left hand. Sometimes you'll see a black guy, like that guy, hit a key with your right hand. Sometimes you'll see good words, like beauty and joy, hit a key with your left hand. Sometimes you'll see bad words, like filth and sick. And if you see a bad word, hit a key with your right hand. Now, if for some reason, I don't know why, if for some reason you have an attitudinal preference in favor of white folks, this is what we would call a schema consistent pairing. Notice that you have the white guy and the good words on the same response key on the left, and you have the black face and the bad words on the same response key on the right. And it turns out in that pairing, we fly through this video game. Because scientists are really devious, randomly in counterbalance, you'll get runs like this. It's like, oh, it's the black face and the good words on the same response key, and the white face and the bad words on the same response key. Then it becomes like rubbing your tummy and you know, hitting your head. <laughs> like, you can do it, but it's a little bit more awkward, and it actually goes a little bit more slowly. The IAT effect is just by definition. Yeah, I'm not going to call you bias. I'm not going to call you prejudice. It's just a reaction time delta. It might be, it's just an empirical question, that you go a little bit more quickly when white guys and good words are paired as compared to black guys and good words. It's just a question and computers can measure. That's called the IAT effect. So suppose you're a scientist. You're like, okay, I can't ask people because I can't really trust them. So I'm going to set up this kind of you know, crazy speed game. Uh, let's have a lot of people play it. If it is a nonsensical game, if it's, if it's like, oh, I'm left-handed, you're right-handed, or oh, Nintendo, you played Xbox, uh, you know, I, none of it makes any sense. It's, it's crazy. It doesn't measure anything. If it's nonsense, but because the faces are randomly counterbalanced, then it should be like flipping a coin. Half the time you should sort good words faster with pictures of black men, half the time with white men, half the time you should sort good words faster with pictures of like deep dish Chicago pizza, and half the time with vomit. It doesn't mean anything. It's just gibberish. It's just gibberish. It's nonsense. Nonsense. Well, this is what we find, is it not? 
nonsense? Well, 80% of us sort good words faster with <coughs> young people as compared to old people. 68% white over black, 68% straight over gay, 69% thin over fat, 76% abled over disabled. 72% of us associate more quickly pictures of black male faces with pictures of weapons than white male faces with pictures of weapons. And these are not even modern day weapons. They're not like Glocks pointed sideways, like in a Fast and Furious way, you know. They're like cannons, maces, calibers, <laughs> Game of Thrones stuff. I don't watch that show. I, I doubt it's that diverse. You know, but, so the point is, maybe it is, I don't know, but, but the point is, it's not as if you can invoke, oh, I'm a statistically rational Bayesian. I know those people carry those. They don't carry maces, really. I don't know what neighborhoods you, outside of a Renaissance fair, they're not carrying maces, really. So the point is there's some association with the black male face as being dangerous, other, that allows us to play that game in one particular direction. Number two, just because it's pervasive, these little reaction time uh, deltas, it doesn't really mean that they're strong in magnitude. It might be that we all have a little bit of bias, but it's just a smidgen. I mean, if it's just a smidgen, you know, we have a legal term for it, we call it de minimis, and we move on. Right? One way to try to figure it out, because we don't have any intuition for milliseconds, is at Project Implicit, where they're collecting all this data, they will also ask you anonymous, explicit questions. It's between old people and young people, whom do you prefer? It's between white people and black people, whom do you prefer? And because you ask yourself and then click a, a one through seven scale, it's a measure of explicit attitudes, explicit bias. Mm -hmm. um, and people will admit that there are some preferences. These are explicit bias scores. But when you juxtapose explicit bias scores to implicit bias scores, almost always uh -huh. implicit score are larger in magnitude when they're brought to the same statistical units. So, you know, if you want to get an intuitive feel of what your implicit biases are in terms of strength, you know you got some explicit junk in your head. You got some biases. Whatever they are, just imagine your implicit to be stronger. Number three, you might think, well, yes, that explains everyone else, but I, like, I voted for Obama twice. Some of my <laughs> best friends actually are black. No, no, I'm good, I'm good. It turns out no one is immune, and the best way to see this is to focus on the elderly. Uh, why? Uh, because in some sense, age is one social category that you actually want to move from young to old with your knees intact. So this is a measure <laughs> of explicit biases that people have against the elderly broken out by age groups. So basically if you ask the average teenager, do you like old people? I know you could barely see this, but they basically say they hate old people. <laughs> <laughs> Bias is really high, 0.73. Uh, by contrast, and it's con completely consistent with my lived experience, I have a 14 year old daughter, she speaks smack about old people nonstop, nonstop, right? It's like, She's Asian, she grew up in LA, didn't <laughs> stick. So the point is, uh, no family values, it's all about don't like old people, and she's completely okay sharing that. <laughs> but if you dare, if you ask someone in the 60s, right, mm -hmm. and dare I say an older person, mm -hmm. uh, they show essentially no bias. They say it's between old and young, you know, whatever. This negative slope line makes perfect sense, because when you're young over here, right on, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, it's like old people, it's them, yuck, them, you know, they dress funny, they drive slow, they sing MC Hammer's rap music, everything is <laughs> But age is one category that you start here, but you actually want to get over here gracefully, right? But once you get over here and you become old, like, no, 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 you misunderstood me, I'm not slow, I'm deliberate, right? I'm, I'm not old, I'm wise. Oscar yeah, Wilde yeah. was correct when he said youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> it's like, just because I wear my pants up here doesn't mean I should be aged out of Silicon Valley. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because we love ourselves and we understand ourselves. And once you change teams and become the elderly, once you join that group, it's like, no, 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 I love myself my family. I love my groups. I love my tribes. I'm part of the elderly. I love the elderly. It makes sense. What do you think implicit bias scores are? Flat across the board. What's really most striking is here, right? Old pe older people, right, in their 60s. This is what we call dissociation. I know you can't really see from the back, but explicitly they have zero bias against themselves, which is entirely predictable. Implicitly they sort Young faces faster with good words just like everybody else. And that's a radical dissociation. You have every incentive to love your own team, and yet we see examples where you don't. So this suggests that maybe right, uh, no one really is immune. Maybe Nietzsche was right. There is no immaculate perception even of ourselves. Look, I've gone a long time. Um, you know, giving you all this methodology, giving you definitions of how we measure stuff. But in truth, um, 300 milliseconds, 
that are pervasive that no one is immune to is interesting, but we as lawyers especially care about behavior. We care about acts of discrimination, not just mental states. You need the conjoining of mental state plus some behavior before we find it legally that interesting. Is there a consequence? And again, I can't go through all the literature, but I have to just, I want you to be skeptical, but I want to share with you that there's been evidence that implicit bias, which is a mental construct up here, that is measured crudely by stupid video games on reaction time measures that you can do on the internet right now, even on your phone. Those reaction times have been found to measure or predict behavior of the following sorts to a small degree. Who gets called back on resumes? Awkwardness of body language, whether I smile or I'm stiff towards you. Whether you hire men over women in resume portfolio studies. Whether you cut minority student organization budgets more when you are hit with a 15% shortfall in funds. How interns actually recommend treatment for myocardial infarctions in both Georgia and the city of, in the city of Atlanta and the city of Boston. The speed of shooting African Americans in video game simulations to shoot or not shoot, depending on whether the target is carrying a Coke can, a wallet, a cell phone versus a gun. Indeed, actual use of force in the field by police officers, because there is, and I, it, it breaks my heart to say this, it turns out there is an implicit stereotype type that allows most people to associate black males more quickly with gorillas than great than great cats, <laughs> although both are African. And that strength of association predicts how much a, a, a police officers over predict the age of African American youth, which also then predicts how much force is actually used in the field. So I realize we care about behavior. But what I'm trying to suggest is that even if you're skeptical, there's evidence that these measures of implicit biases that we might not even know that we have have some predictive value. I'm not saying it explains everything, but some predictive value over behaviors that we care about. And you might ask how much, in what way, in all kinds of ways. All that I'm going to suggest, and I'm going to go through all kinds of gruesome detail, is that if you're skeptical, and I want you to be skeptical, scientists, um, the way scientists actually um, pull the entire literature together. Like we as lawyers would say, well, well tell an RA or younger associate, oh, just do the literature. Then you get a 50-page memo of like every blue sky law or something like that. Scientists don't have time to read that many pages. They just want one number. They do something called a meta-analysis where they actually will pull all the studies that have ever been done or not done and then translate all the findings, the strength or magnitude of effect sizes, into one number, stitching them all together such that studies that had more subjects run through the experiment might be credited more. And I just want to share with you what the numbers look like. When the first meta-analysis is done, this is the number that's actually found. <coughs> Tony Greenwald, who actually invented the IAD, finds some number called R, Pearson's R equals 0.236. I realize we went to law school for a reason. These numbers are largely cryptic <laughs> even to me. But I'm just telling you what they find. And I'm not going to engage in necessarily a dueling experts conversation. But what's interesting is that a few years later, a bunch of people who are really smart, who get paid extreme amounts of money to actually defend against a class action certification on the basis of implicit bias testimony, published their own paper. And they found in their own analysis, different R, R equals 0.19. What's interesting is twofold. First, they couldn't make it zero, just like Tony Greenwald, who invented the IAD, couldn't make it one, the highest number. Because science actually disciplines you in a way that opinions about constitutional law oftentimes go. The other thing is, a standard debater's trick is just to concede the other side. So the team that's most hostile to this literature published in a peer-reviewed journal, 0.15. That is some measure of linear correlation between X and Y variables. I realize it doesn't necessarily mean anything to us. I wanted to try to figure out, is there some way for us to get a gut sense? You know what I did? I looked at what medical common sense looks like. Indeed, given the fact that Flint, Michigan, and its drinking water has been in the news, I looked for the correlations between low-level lead exposure and reduced childhood IQ. Do you know what that correlation is? It is just 0.12. Lower than the correlation found by the team that is most hostile to this literature. 
I don't even know how to think about that. If I see a kid in the corner, I don't know, I, regardless of drinking water, like sucking on like lead paint chips off of an old windowsill, I'm running over there and like I'm slapping on the upside. It's like stop eating that. I don't care if it's even if it's a white child, I'm going over there and stopping it. <laughs> and the kid will look at me because I like the taste. And I say, but but it'll make you dumb. Look at you. You've got nothing to start with. I mean, like, stop. <laughs> and the kid will say, have you read the literature? And I'll say, oh. And if he says it's just point one two, hmm. put a sock in it. What am I supposed to say? What do we really know? On what basis do we change our daily lives? What multivitamins do you pop every day on the basis of some infographic you saw on USA Today? We demand a certain kind of metaphysical certitude often for those inconvenient facts that we don't want to actually accept as true, but we embrace the facts that we think are convenient for us, and we do it on all sides, whether you're left or right, we're just deeply motivated people. All I'm trying to suggest is the following, and I want to switch a little bit to thinking about law and, and, and leave some time for questions, so I want to try to come, uh, come back and, 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 um, and just try to suggest the following. Look, um, I care about whether or not there is a tournament of merit. I care for all kinds of reasons. I'm an immigrant. I've hustled hard. I thought I got, you know, I, you know, my parents never made it out of like you know, middle school. They don't talk about it. I had a hard life. I want to struggle. No one gave me anything. Of course, it's part of that ethic, that work ethic, fiercely individualistic, that's primed in any election season. That suggests that is what we want, but we want to fight in a fair game. And I think the best evidence suggests to the question, do we live currently in a tournament of merit? I think the best answer is not yet. Even to make it a little bit more personal, if I ask you, do you discriminate? Do you discriminate? Notwithstanding, you're getting all teary-eyed when you see Martin Luther King you know, streaming on YouTube. Do you discriminate? I think the best evidence-based answer is, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. The force of implicit bias, whether you want to use it as a headwind, whether you want to think of it as a slight gravitational warping, alters our daily interactions in such a way that we are not as fair and square as we'd like to think. And I can show you other ways why little things, we get it over time, because I want to sh show you, like, whatever that point one five, one two, whatever that little headwind is, if you actually integrate it over time for an individual's life, every handshake, every opportunity, every, every memorandum turned in, every pitch that either got a client or didn't get a client, every argument, every conversation, every time someone could stand up for you or chose not to, if you integrate that over time and put a slight disability on one group of people versus another, and then you actually double integrate that, not only across time, but across all men versus all women, all white folks versus all non-white folks, all that I'm suggesting is that the disparities that we see all around us, that are so common, that are so perplexing, where we all say it's a coincidence, I don't understand it, but it seems to happen all the time, that a lot of the hierarchy and the disparity that we never wanted, never signed off on, but never received and are embedded in, could be explained by some things as tiny as implicit biases. Don't get me wrong, stone cold racism, stone cold sexism clearly exists. I don't mean to suggest it doesn't. Don't get me wrong, structures matter. Where you built the highways, intergenerational wealth transfer, all kinds of stuff, just <coughs> cortisol levels on kidneys, right? All that stuff structurally <laughs> matter. But what I'm trying to suggest is that even if you put those aside, because you don't think stone cold racists and sexists are in this room, because you don't care about history, because you never owned any slaves, or you didn't intern anyone, you didn't take over anyone's property, you weren't, a, you know, a sooner. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> I went there. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. All that I'm saying is little things might actually matter. Now, now I want to switch gears because I can go on for hours on science, and I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about re rhetoric. And I want to acknowledge that this talk is odd in all kinds of ways. I want to ask what's different here. There are these two sets of things that I think are different. One, notice that I wasn't talking a lot about norms, about what's right, what's wrong. I wasn't having a conversation with you about, you know, do we want corrective justice? Do we want distributive justice? Like, what? Are, you know, I always get those two mixed up. 
stuff? Like, you know, what are all the different flavors of justice? Have I forgot the laws? Is that Emmanuel Kant? Like, I wasn't talking about norms, even though lots of smart people in this room think a lot about uh, how to think about norms and what norms ought to be embedded in something as grand as, as sort of grand as the Equal Protection Clause. Instead, I'm focusing on facts. Are you fair and square? I'm intentionally trying to meet people where they are because for over a decade, I tried to push people on norm, but I had actually very little luck. And so I switched to pushing people on facts. The second thing that's unusual about this talk is that it's not principally about textual interpretation. A lot of civil rights law is really trying to interpret ambiguous texts written by people who never thought of the question, and even if they thought of the question, would have never given you a very intelligent answer at time zero. Trying to actually interpret what they would have thought or could have thought, given ambiguities within the text and underlying policy commitments. That's a, a lot of legal reasoning, it seems to me, both constitutional and otherwise. I'm not doing that. Instead, I spent like, I blew my 35 minutes giving you science, even though this is in some ways a civil rights lecture about the law. And I am in some ways unabashedly trading on what might be called an epistemological supremacy. I'm not engaging in either soft or hard, weak or strong, <laughs> critiques of science. I'm just taking it for granted that just as an artifact, that in 21st century times, when there's a contested question about empirical fact, we resolve it through what we call science and hypothesis testing published in tier one research university uh, sort of uh, peer reviewed journals, right? But I'm trying to suggest that is one way to actually solve and sort of uh, think about uh, problems anew. So this is an unusual lecture, uh, and I'm trying to suggest that I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it for a reason that is, in some ways, uncertain. The title of the talk focuses on the force of implicit bias, right? The science and the rhetoric. And regardless of what you think about the science, the science is a performance of a particular kind of rhetoric. For the people who are totally skeptical, they think science is just a narrative story that you tell. Instead of anecdotal, you actually did it clinical. But I'm trying to actually get your own reactions. And one of the things that I want to do in the conversation is try to figure out, does this alter the nature of the conversation? Does it alter the terrain? I want to spot a few challenges that comes from trying to use science to move factual assumptions to actually change institutions, whether they be universities like UCLA or legal regimes like Title VII, equal protection analysis. I would just want to spot a few challenges. And I, then I just actually want to have a conversation about trying to figure out whether there's a there there to anything that I'm trying to do. You should know that I get a lot of pushback from what is ostensibly my, politically, uh, my political left. A lot of people find my and my focus on implicit bias deeply disturbing because it seems too conciliatory. A lot of people say, look, you know that they're stone cold racist. They're just calling it implicit, but they're just hiding it. Why are you giving them a get out of jail? More after, why are you giving them a permission slip from the doctor to say, oh, uh, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all biased, let's move on. So it's too conciliatory. The left actually critiques that. Moreover, the invocation of the science and the tendency to reduce things, not, uh, not to actually expand them in complexity, to understand structural, institutional, historical uh, processes, to focus indeed, dare I say, on the neurons. Uh, as being a reductionist move that ultimately misleads people into thinking that race and racism, for example, or gender and sexism could actually be caught ever on anything like a reaction type measure. So there's a pushback from the left. There's, of course, a pushback from the right. And principally, the move has been either outright denial or a turn to saying this is essentially junk science, right? There's no there there. Scientists are making it up because they want to guilt trip you into actually wealth transfers from one group to another and the only way they can do that is to make you feel that you're more biased than you in fact are. Now, again, I'm deeply motivated, but I have seen this before. For example, it turns out Brown and Williamson, a tobacco company, said the following, doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact of the system of the public. It is also the means of establishing a controversy. This was an internal memorandum that they shared. Of course, whenever you fight the other side, you're going to call them the tobacco companies, generally speaking. It turns out... 
I'm sure I insulted a couple of people here, but the point is, it turns out to be an effective debater script. It, it, it might be undeserved, but how do you know when anyone invokes that this is junk science, whether it is in fact a sincere criticism, a sincere skepticism about facts, which actually is core to the scientific method, or just a political ploy to shut down inconvenient truths. And the final thing that I want to suggest is that there is, excuse me, a deep, hard problem with the nature of probabilistic knowledge. If you accept the basic thrust of my factual argument, my argument about the facts, all that you find out is probabilistic knowledge, that we, without knowing anything more, are not nearly as fair and square as we like to think of this. So all that means is that probabilistically, right, over large ends, over large numbers of rolling this dice, it doesn't actually come up as fair as we think. But in any one particular occasion, when this faculty decides to hire one person versus another, when this faculty decides to either match a salary offer in this way versus that way, when you as a lawyer have to decide, you know, if you're a judge, you have to decide whether you grant, you know, this kind of bail or that kind of bail. On any one incident, it's almost impossible to know whether that one particular incident was influenced by something called implicit bias. And the law actually, uh, you know, has a hard time dealing with probabilistic knowledge. This is why toxic torts is such an interesting challenge. But my point is just, with that comparison, is just to emphasize that it's a challenge because the problem is real, not that the problem is imagined. I know it is so much easier to think of racism or sexism essentially as an individual tort. Mm -hmm. So someone with a fist threw the fist and hit my jaw and broke it without cause, right? There is linear causation of a fist moving at a particular velocity that breaks the jaw. We can actually figure out perpetrator, we can figure out victim, we can figure out what recompense ought to be. That one-to-one -one body collision is something that the law is very comfortable understanding, generally speaking. But once it becomes not one-to-one, -one, but many-to-many -many in an invisible, probabilistic way, then it's all the hard questions that you see in toxic torts. If you see a slight cancer cluster outside of a nuclear power plant, you know kids get leukemia for reasons we don't know. But if you just see a slightly larger uptick, you see the cluster, how are you supposed to demonstrate that one particular piece of gamma ray radiation entered this person's DNA at this particular time causing this mutation that caused this kind of leukemia? You can never demonstrate that with the kind of precision that we would ultimately want. Nevertheless, the legal system has crunched through those cases and stumbled forward. And I suggest that this, too, can be an example of how we might stumble forward. There's so much more that I can talk about, but I want to actually engage in some Q&A and conversation. Let me pull back and just try to suggest the following. <coughs> I don't mean to be sarcastic when I say we seek a tournament of merit. I think we really want the tournament of merit. I think it should matter how good you are, how hard you hustle. I don't mean to suggest that merit is self-defining. Any, any smart person should be able to unpack that merit is a relational goal. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you want uh, merit in a bar fight, it looks different from merit in an academic decathlon, and rarely do the same people qualify. <laughs> <laughs> I get that, but we want a tournament of merit. What I'm trying to suggest is that we're not as good as we think we are. And it's that fundamental sense of humility that I've been using to open up new kinds of conversations with people who actually have won the tournament. Because we're actually deeply invested in thinking that the tournaments that we won were fair and square. Fair and square. When you win a prize, you never want to think the prize, was, the prize was given to you. You always want to think that you earned it fair and square. So when I talk to people in positions of power, oftentimes men, oftentimes white, and when I try to tell them that they can do better, and it is not a pitch for increased charity, it is not a pitch for increased welfare for people who just couldn't survive in the Tournament of Merit. It is instead a pitch to say you have particular ideals. I did not give them to you, but you seem to seek a Tournament of Merit. The best evidence suggests 
that you've gone part of the way. Maybe you're at 90%, maybe you're at 95%, maybe you're at 97% of the way. But in a competitive environment like America today, that little bit of a drag, whether it's 5%, 3%, 2%, has predictable consequences that I can show you with all the math and with all the science. So I don't actually care right, whether you have implicit biases. Oftentimes after these talks, including these men of influence and position and power, they usually come up to me in a rapid gait and say, well, you know, you're saying I have implicit I usually say, back off, I'm not that into you first. <laughs> <laughs> but the second thing is it's entirely banal. It's entirely uninteresting that you might have implicit biases. I have them. We have different kinds, to be sure. It's not that interesting that you have them. You'd be an odd person. Um, if you show no bias whatsoever. The only thing that matters is not whether you have implicit bias, the only thing that matters is what you're willing to do about it. And that's the question that I present to you for conversation and enlightenment. Thank you very much. I mean, that's probably why I, I intentionally stopped early. Uh, so, my lunch mate. So, uh, a, I mean, there are a number of lessons that one could learn from your talk. Um, many people in this room have jobs that give them a lot of discretion about how to resolve things with their jobs or, you know, with, with their lives. And I wonder, uh, I guess one, takeaway, potential takeaway point is that we should potentially have less discretion. Uh, one takeaway point would be that um, that we should be more self-conscious about how we exercise our discretion. I, I just, I wonder uh, if you have uh, a different takeaway point about how we as people who might be prone to these associations might go about doing our, our, our jobs. Yes. So, uh, so there are lots of things. I mean, there. I mean, I, I again. I, you know, I can give lots of practical uh, suggestions. But it's actually uh, strangely right. Strategically, if I have to say a couple things, I would just say uh, these three things. So, in some ways, there is a step zero. A step zero is uh, to actually embrace humility. There's beautiful. Uh, there's beautiful tests that suggest that the more objective you think you are, the worse you do on all these odd uh, steps. So I go into every engagement, even. The Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, whatever that might mean, just assuming that I'm just going to mess this up. I, like, I'm mindful of race, I'm a guy, I'm clueless about gender, so I'm, I have to especially be sensitive about what that means. So it turns out, if you think, and I can't tell you since I have to train faculty all the time, if you think you already know everything, hands down, that opens up your likelihood of screwing things up all kinds of ways. And I can't tell you how many faculty, righteous faculty, and I can't tell whether it's faculty or Article III judges who are more confident of themselves. <laughs> you know, it's a death match, you can't tell. But the point is for them to be so certain that they know quality when they see it, I think, yeah, maybe data suggests otherwise. So that's number one. Humility as a mind. And you don't need dollars from this. You don't need approval from managing partners. Or You go into every situation assuming that you're actually going to be not that good. And that actually paradoxically helps in getting, uh, getting, in getting better. So the other two strategies uh, about subjectivity, um, um, uh, uh, the, the other uh, strategy, subjectivity, is also something that's important. Like, so I don't trust my gut. I mean, I used to trust my gut. I used to think, like, Psh, I know, I know, I trust my gut. But that, but it turns out your gut is terrible, especially when it comes to dealing with people across social categories. Your gut, is, I mean, your gut just isn't that good. It explains your first car, your first house, maybe your first marriage. Really, in LA, you have to be <laughs> but your gut really isn't that good. And so it turns out, especially in dealing with people across social categories, I'm actually much less willing. And when people say, "I know it," like he has that it factor, it's like candle pop. Mm -hmm. But really, you just said candle power? Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk. Sure, he's smart, but is he really smart? So the point is, without making fun of academics, the point is that um, trusting your gut is something I'm actually uh, much more skeptical about. So then the question is, how do you actually rein in discretion? So you can think about how to do structured interviews, right? Which don't have to be, again, reading just the script, but having some structure. You can imagine uh, different ways. You know, 
uh, selective poking of information. There's beautiful evidence like the orchestra studies, right? We didn't have women participating in orchestras, but after the Boston Symphony Orchestra decided to do tryouts behind a blind, there's a huge uptick of women who actually get selected for professional orchestras. There's great auditing studies. Again, some don't find results, but there's great auditing studies where if you send out the exact same memorandum uh, with different names or certainly resumes with different names, either with Emily or Lakeisha, Greg or Jamal, we don't need faces to raise people. We know Lakeisha's not a white person. It's not to judge. You just know Lakeisha's not a white person, right? So like Emily could be a white person, Karen could be a white person, Apple is surely a white person. Um, <laughs> It's not Lakeisha, and so then immediately you see the race effect. So there's selective disclosure or suppression of information, or cloaking of it. There's also cabining of discretion in different kinds of ways, recognizing that oftentimes that means discretion has been distributed elsewhere, like in sentence guidelines. But I do encourage people strategically to be aware of subjectivity. This other thing that I want to emphasize is to increase accountability. There's a lot of stuff I can uh, tell you. Um, you know, maybe I'll focus on... Uh, this one, just because I don't know anything about baseball and I made fun of like sports teams recently. So, <laughs> did you know that umpires, umpire, you could ask, do you think the race of an umpire matters when you're calling balls and strikes? If you told a black umpire, oh, you call more strikes for black pitchers, that would be outrageous. Same thing for white umpires, you call more strikes for white pitchers, that would be outrageous. But it turns out behavioral economists wanted to know. And they checked, right, every pitch thrown Three and a half million pitches over a four-year season. Here's the long story short. Um, they find no, they find a little uptick, but nothing statistically significant. So after doing data analysis to look for same uh, race preference, they find nothing, right? And with data sets that large, if you don't find anything statistically significant, there's nothing going on. But here's something that's really interesting. It turned out a third of the stadia had the Questex system installed during that time. And the Questex system is a bunch of cameras, maybe seven to 10 cameras, trained on the umpire to decide whether or not they're calling balls and strikes in a consistent manner. It is like having the NSA watch over every call. In those games, in the Questex games, there was no race matching effect. But in the other games, the umpires felt free to call it as they saw it. There was a 0.6% increase in calling strikes and that became statistically significant. So there's great evidence, there's better evidence now that says, if you phone it in, either because you think you're great and you think you know everything, or you call it as you see it and you do your little dance, strike three or out, whatever. If you call it as you see it and there's no accountability, it turns out we phone it in and when we phone it in, we break on the margins in favor of biases. So how do you create structures of accountability? If you're a trial court and you know you have an appellate court that will watch over everything that you do, a potential auditor, right? Then you actually do it more carefully, which actually means that by slowing down and being more careful, we actually tend to make less biased decisions. So what I like, not only is this kind of idea to kind of, you know, un unconsciousness raising, to be mindful of the fact that we have to be mindfully equal, otherwise we're going to be mindlessly unequal in our actions. But it's also true that I'm really skeptical about mental states because it's hard to control, it's hard to change, and we always break in favor of what we you know, are used to. So you want to create structures of accountability. And if you want to figure out, well, what do you mean by accountability? Oftenest I mean count. Can you count? I'd be plenty happy to get a self-critical analysis privilege that doesn't allow self-counting and self-analysis to be discoverable if it really led to institutions counting more what they do. And I think generally speaking, when you start counting, you find embarrassing results in all kinds of ways. Who gets the good work if you're a first-year associate at a leading law firm, right? If you just counted those power hours, inside of six months, you would see huge rips that couldn't be justified by the actual qualities of the lawyers that you brought in that early into the game. So those are the things I would recommend, but I'm happy to, again, those are strategies. I'm happy to talk Again, in grander form, offline, if people are interested. But uh, yeah, don't trust your gut. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm wondering if there's a remedy in uh, emphasizing diversity. Uh, uh -huh. It seems we have a bias against diversity in a sense, or uh -huh. we're going to here, that with uh, social sense, we might be able to educate more people in terms of the benefits. There are clear measurable benefits, I'm yeah. certain, to diversity. And so, you know, 
that word diversity these days means so much uh, and so li little. I mean, I think most lawyers recognize that the word diversity got traction in part because of Bakke's plurality opinion, excuse me, uh, Justice Powell's plurality opinion in Bakke, and in part because there couldn't be agreement on responding to societal discrimination because suffused general unfairness to a whole bunch of the people was not something that would be accepted as a compelling interest. They had to find something else, and so they went to diversity. The best way to accept that was say, oh, intellectual diversity, we want a university full of ideas. And that has been what has carried a lot of weight going forward, even though the concept itself, I think, has been um, expanded and contorted in uncomfortable <coughs> ways. It, you should just know, as a footnote, it did set a trap. I mean, it guaranteed a trap of the following sort. If you want intellectual diversity, why not just look at ideas? Why are you using body types as proxies for ideas? If you want to know whether someone's conservative, ask whether they're conservative. Don't assume that because he has this body type that he might be liberal or conservative. That is both essentialistic in all kinds of ways. Um, it's, uh, it's essentialism in the worst kinds of ways. And it begs all the questions about why you don't have like conservative viewpoints or people who think the world is flat, et cetera, but I digress. So the point <laughs> is, diversity itself has a particular, that concept has traveled in ways that people don't understand, especially the younger kids, younger students, adults, young adults, who came right into that debate and conversation without recognizing um, what it might mean. I, I actually like, but, but I think your larger question is, what can we do to emphasize diversity, there, there, uh, or could there be remedies? I just want to give you one study that by which you can actually do that, and then um, um, talk about uh, other ways in which it might uh, be relevant. When I say that there are implicit biases, you might get really depressed. You're like, well, maybe they're just hardwired. We just have all these biases, and like, we're screwed. It's immutable. Don't blame me. <laughs> now, now I'm just going to drink more and just move on. Um, I will always be racist, sexist, what homophobic, all that stuff. I think that's overreading it in all kinds of ways. I mean, categorical thinking is required, but the contents of the categories are fed to us by the societies in which we live. I mean, the best way to just understand that is I tell people, look, there's a country where a disproportionate, disproportionate percentage of the athletes, criminals, um, um, and entertainers are Korean. And I'm not talking about Korea. It's Japan. And you might think, from a distance, you can't, obviously we share ancestry, come on, I mean, come on. We're obviously, we can't tell a genetic story about that. But the point is, and the Koreans don't have that kind of rap here in the United States. Like, we're not viewed as the best like entertainers. Are you, you don't see us, like, do you see us on prime time? Not so much. So the point is, even though categorical thinking is hardwired, the content of the categories are given to us by society. And here's a really beautiful experiment that I, I really want to share with you. This is an experiment where people measured longitudinally the implicit stereotypes that women held against themselves before college and after one year of college. So women like men have internalized the idea that men are the leaders, women are the supporters. Men lead, women bake the cookies and push them afterwards. Right? That, that, that's the gross implicit stereotype that holds women back. Right? That is the single worst stereotype that holds women back. So one group of women start here, and after one year of college in a liberal northeastern uh, venue, standard co-ed college, their implicit stereotypes <laughs> against themselves goes up, goes up, now sending this thing an ivory tower. Another group of women start a little bit lower, but they go down on average to zero. I realize that these are different women. There's a selection bias problem because they weren't, women weren't randomly assigned to colleges. And no parent would sign off on that. So you might have you know, different kinds of women intentionally going to an all-women's college versus a co-ed college. I get that. But the angle is so radically different that people want to try to figure out what's driving it. And so people think, well, look, this is what? This must be Wellesley. I mean, you know, Wellesley, they're just, you know. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this with like, an Italian accent, but the point is, they, they're just thinking, like, it's just, you know, it's just, no, they, they controlled for classes taken, they controlled for clubs participated, they controlled for everything. The one thing they predicted, this change, right, if you do multivariate regression, the number of women professors and deans they have. And it turns out at all women's colleges, you have more women professors, not all of them. But especially in the sciences, you have like half of them be women professors, whereas that's not the case in most co-ed places. So you are what you see. We're just neural 
pattern recognized. Mm -hmm. If you all, like the first time you see someone like me up here teaching a class, you might think, like, a law class, that's weird. Like, I started teaching 20 years ago. I looked 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. My civil procedure <laughs> students were quite miffed. This is not the law school experience they had expected. Mm -hmm. First time, really disturbing. Second time, if they see someone else like me, like, oh, you know, a little unusual. Third time, it's like, yeah, he sucks like everyone else, and you go back to tweeting. <laughs> because no big deal. And that's, in fact, what much of civil rights is about. It's the right to be no big deal. Indeed, the right to be mediocre, just like the white guys, right? So that's what we want to be, the right to be as mediocre as everyone else. It's no big deal. So part of what you believe is part of what you see, and part of what you see is part of what you believe. So this is a long, uh, wow. drawn-out answer. Yeah. But I do think, if to the extent that you're asking, look, is there something about emphasizing diversity? I want to suggest that there is a strategy of exposing people intentionally to devising agents. You should also know that there are peer-to-peer -peer phenomena, like the, the number of Latino friends that you have or the number of gay friends you have predict lower implicit bias scores as well. So there's a peer-to-peer -peer phenomenon, and it's consistent with the general social context hypothesis that's been verified both on explicit and implicit bias. But there's also a top-down radiating phenomenon where if you get exposed to a counter-typical exemplar, Whatever that might be, it might be a woman dean, it might be an Asian professor, it might be like, like if I played rap music, maybe that's what would blow your mind, right, mm -hmm. in a particular kind of way. But it turns out to be good to see that because it expands out our cognitive limitations, the jail in which we operate uh, because we have schemas and we could not do otherwise. So there are ways to think about, just to make this a little bit more legal, the role model justification under either Title VII or Equal Protection Law, isn't well, it's very hard to justify race conscious or gender conscious hiring on the basis of, of, oh, this person will be a role model. For me to point to like the one Asian person in the room and say, oh, because, or the two Asian people in the room, it, oh, because I'm here, I'm gonna be a role model to them, that creates a certain kind of racial tracking and beneficiaries that drive people like Justice Thomas crazy. And maybe for right reasons. You should be able to find role models in anything, in anyone, right? I should be able to have heroes that don't look like me. And that's the part of America that we embrace. But the role model theory has largely been discredited as a legal concept. What I'm pushing forward is not a role model theory. It's not, if I do work on my civil procedure students, it's not principally to my Asian students. It's to everyone, including the white students. I'm scrubbing their brains. Because the next time they go litigate against a guy like me, they're going to be wondering, oh, it might be like Kong, I'm, I'm, I'm underprepared yet again. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that might actually do some good to promote equity in this world. And so well, all that I'm saying is, can the science justify a different mechanism to justify a slightly different compelling interest that is about anti-discrimination, not about, uh, say, diversity within the classroom, but it's actually to decrease the likelihood of discrimination within a category of people that you're training for the future. So I've written about this in different kinds of ways, but I think there are different moves that are available because the mechanisms and the vectors of change that we can actually identify using this science look a little bit different. So that you get new wiggle room on why race consciousness and gender consciousness, when they're well-crafted, right, in light of the existing science and the magnitude of the effect sizes, can be given new justifications that aren't constrained by old ones that were litigated and lost. Hmm. I know I'm running late. Yeah, one, one more question. question. One, one last question. question. Mm -hmm. Diversity would be great. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my name is Emily, by the way. In terms of explicit bias and the current presidential campaign. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, can I, can I say this? I'm trying to figure out, can I say this? Can I say this? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I've got tenure, I can say this. So, um, <laughs> there was a moment. Um, I started working on this stuff like a long time ago, and was about stuff maybe around 2003, but there was a moment before. Uh, uh, Obama got elected uh, to his presidency, where a bunch of people um, flew in for a meeting in the hotel of the Chicago uh, of Chicago O'Hare Airport. 
So it's an odd combination of people. It included lawyers, social scientists, Democratic pollsters, and some people with money. <laughs> and this is before the economy had tanked, or was it was about to go off the cliff, but it didn't really. McCain and Obama were running neck to neck. There was only a couple percentage points distinguishing them, and people were deeply anxious that those percentage points, because they were self-reported surveys, right, voting, uh, that they weren't capturing what might be implicit bias and how things might look different. And there is some evidence, for example, that implicit biases also predict voting um, uh, to a certain uh, degree. Um, I share with you that story to suggest that even though right now in, in, in the reality TV show that is reality, um, um, <laughs> explicit biases, right, um, mm. are patently clear. There is no, there's no willingness problem. There might be an able problem, but there is no willingness problem on certain of our candidates. So there's a willingness to speak what he b believes to be the truth, and you can see very explicit things. But I want to suggest that at a different time with a different set of candidates, there's a genuine concern that implicit attitudes, right, and that were not being measured by standard polling <coughs> techniques would actually swing the election in a particular kind of way. And then there was an attempt to try to figure out, okay, if this is possible, what kinds of commercial interventions, and I mean commercial, not money, but like literally 30-second spots that you could buy in Ohio on cable, what might actually move the dial? And we actually did. Can I see? Uh, yeah. So th there were some experiments. Some people ran experiments to try to figure out whether certain kinds of interventions would happen. And I just I want to just share with you something that is heartbreaking. Um, there was at least one intervention where it was an African American family um, where a father was re reading to like his uh, tiny daughter. I think I can. I think I can. Little red engine that could. Just rated off the charts, family values everywhere, education, family values, just rated off the charts. But we, we, did, I, we did IATs before and after. And the darker the skin of the families, mm -hmm. the less the effect. The lighter the skin, you got much more swings on implicit attitudes. And oftentimes these swings are only temporary, they last sometimes no more than a, a day or something like that. But it, it's the soul crushing fact of colorism that we all should recognize, even within African American community, especially if you're uh, speaking, uh, you know, not to mixed audience, you know that colorism is a huge issue within all communities, and to see it vindicated in the literature, in the experiments, <clears throat> painful in different kinds of ways, but again, we have to be pragmatic. All of this is to say, look, by talking about implicit bias, I don't mean to let you know, the eye off the ball of explicit stuff. An explicit demagoguery in the name of truth has always existed. And frankly, I appreciate explicit demagoguery uh, often because I know where you're coming from. You're like, talk to me about it. Like, let's go. Let's go. That's what you think. Let's go. Let's go. Like 110%. Let's just go right there. And we can have that conversation. I know who you are. You know who I am. And in the end, we might respect each, of, each other. The, the danger is that's one threat model, and that is causing some problem in this country to be sure. But there's another threat model where every one of us thinks we're already judging people completely fair and square, not recognizing that we're breaking in favor of our in-groups, in favor of the stereotypes and attitudes that we could not have, we could not not have because we grew up in this culture. So those are the things that I'm worried about in both ways, but you should know that smart people you know, think about these uh, questions, but to be honest, right, we know so little. We don't know what works, right, how to fix stuff. Uh, and, um, and, you know, and I'm not sure how quickly we can. I think if you talk to the most serious scientists, the most serious scientists, like, you know, Professor uh, Galoob suggested, many of them just suggest, you know what, uh, give up fixing people's brains and focus just on procedures and structures that constrain discretion, constrain the hell out of discretion. And just accept the fact that if you want to be fair, you don't get to pick. Thank you very much.